welcome. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, do want to talk about this bird, but I also want to talk about something that was in the news that was sort of uh, mind boggling. You may have heard that uh, someone who worked on US government naval reactors um, gathered up a bunch of restricted documents and just mailed them to a foreign government. No one asked for these, just like, hey, I can give you secrets, that's cool. And this foreign government just turns this over to the US government, <laughs> at which point someone from the FBI, and posing as an agent of said foreign government, gets in touch with this guy and over a period of months convinces him to turn over more secrets, at which point he and his wife are arrested. It's like something out of a Coen Brothers movie. Just amazing. Um, the bird for today is the goshawk, uh, a, uh, a sort of fearsome predatory hawk. Uh, many birds, if you kind of come into their territory or near a nest, they'll like make a lot of noise, um, fly around. Uh, the goshawk will actually fly at you and uh, Will like come right by your head, or even or even attack you. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so Peter Bauer, my father, took these pictures, um, uh, and they have uh, big, fearsome claws. So yeah, you do not do not want to tangle uh, with these things uh, at all. Uh, the hawk on my shirt is not a goshawk; is a, a red-tailed hawk, somewhat friendlier. Uh, and this is a, a red-tailed hawk, but uh, probably a juvenile, since it does not have the red uh, on its tail yet. Uh, all right. What questions do you have about the, the lab and any assembly stuff that we've been looking at um, to get us started? Lisa. Just to make clear, if we need to get to, like, basic spaces, we still need to some data where uh, descriptions or? Uh, if you diffuse six phases, do you need to submit the descriptions? Uh, no. Uh, the six phases is 57 points plus three from the, the checking test. So the descriptions are you diffuse the first four phases and then write two descriptions. That's the sort of uh, alternate version of the lab. Other questions? Jay. This may be a silly question. I kind of just got started. But I'm trying, um, based off of what I was looking at, you know, there are different things being stored in different memory addresses. How do you know which one would be? Um, would it be the thing that's the function returning, or like how would you know? Like if there's multiple strings, for example, numbers in the code, how do you know what you're looking for? So, uh, how do you know what different registers are being used for? Um, this is where stepping through the assembly one instruction at a time and uh, using the, the TUI, the TUI mode that some folks have uh, posted about on the, the form can make this a, a little bit easier. It just shows you the registers the, the whole time. Um, but phase two has a function called read six numbers that it calls. Uh, the function name is not a lie. It will read six numbers. So a good strategy is if your input is six numbers, Make the six numbers different numbers so that you can tell which of them the assembly is putting in a register when you print out the register. If you like make all of them one, you're not going to be able to tell like is this the third number or the first number that that the program is dealing with at this point. Uh, yeah, they're just and something that that can also be helpful is if you like copy paste the assembly into a separate file and take or print it out and take notes on the assembly as you're stepping through like what values are used when, that can also be helpful in kind of putting together a, a picture of what's going on. Other questions? <laughs> All right. So we are basically a full class behind. So today is catch up day. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about both arrays and structs, how they're actually laid out in memory and how uh, how assembly code interacts with both. We'll start off with arrays. The uh, thing that I am not going to talk about in order to uh, allow us to catch up is multi-dimensional arrays, like a, a kind of a, a 2D array. There's lots about this in the notes, but it's going to be optional 
uh, material for the course. Um, uh, you can uh, take a look at it if you want, but it's not, it's not required. We're going to be dropping that to, to save a bit of time. All right, so for an array, to review the, the, the syntax, uh, we might declare an array like so. We have the T is the type of thing that we're putting in the array. <coughs> we have a variable name uh, of the array and the size of the array, which is the number of things of the type T that are, that are in the array. So this, this size, not necessarily the number of bytes the array takes up because depending on what type of thing we're putting into it, uh, each, each element of the array may, may take different number of bytes. So uh, if we had char message 12, how many bytes? Is that array going to going to allocate? Twelve, because char is one byte. So we have uh, something like this, where. Our variable message, MSG, would be the address of the first byte in our array. And if we go 12 bytes forward from that, that's the end of our array. If we have int val 5, how many bytes will that be? <coughs> yeah, 24 bytes for int times 5 is, is 20 bytes. So all of whenever we have an array, it's going to be a contiguous chunk of memory. Every element will be right next to the one four, and they'll be in the order uh, of, our, of our elements. <coughs> So we'll have five uh, integers. Val is there. Val plus four is the start of our next, uh, uh, the, the address of our next integer. Val plus eight of the next, and, and so on. This was 20 bytes, 12 bytes. How about double, uh, an array of three doubles? 24. 24, because each double is eight bytes. And we make a similar drawing where A, and A plus eight, and A plus 16. <coughs> are the addresses of our, our elements in this array. And lastly, <coughs> if we have car star P with three things in it, how many bytes will that be? Yeah, again, 24, because each of our pointers, our memory addresses, are eight bytes. And it will be the same picture as our double, where it's eight bytes for, for every element. Questions on this? So, some more syntax. If we want to just initialize an array with a specific, uh, specific values,
can do that with curly braces. So this both allocates our 20 bytes uh, for our array and initializes the five integers inside of it. And uh, again, our, the addresses of our integers, x, x plus 4, x plus 8, x plus 12, x plus 16. So, going to write a number of expressions. We're going to consider the type and the value for each of these expressions. Some, some integer i. So one thing that we need to, to talk about before we can work out what some of these are is how pointer arithmetic functions in C. So that uh, what I mean by, by pointer arithmetic is, let's say we have Yeah, so let's say that we have some pointer p and I set it equal to my array variable x. This is just saying that p is now pointing to that first element of our array, since arrays are just the address of the first element in that array. And then if we say, so, Let's say that we're just deciding for the sake of this example that that address at the start of our array is hex 100. So if we do p plus 1, is that going to give us hex 101? No, I see some folks shaking your head. Eric, why not? Exactly. That when we add to a pointer in C, it will move that pointer by the size of the thing that it points to. So P plus one says move one ints worth of bytes. And so indeed this will be hex 104. We move, we add kind of one ints worth to the address. John? Is it possible to instantiate a pointer like without catching <clears throat> Just like have a generalized pointer? Uh, the question is can we can we have a generic or generalized pointer? We can. And the type of that in C is void star. It's a memory address, but it has no information about what kind of thing it's pointing to. So if, if we're doing pointer arithmetic with a, a void star, would it just move the pointer by the other one? Uh, that or it wouldn't compile. I'd have to, I'd have to I, I think the compiler would at least warn you that you're doing arithmetic with a, a, a void star. Um, and that might be an error. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, other questions? 
<clears throat> All right, so before we get into the uh, assembly side of things, let's do a bit of practice with what these expressions are going to give us in terms of their type. Is it going to be an integer or is it going to be a pointer to an integer? And what the value, if we can determine what the value is, will be. So uh, work with your neighbors to, to fill in this tape. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk through this. Uh, I did just check. If you add to a, a void star, it just adds one byte. It will let you do it. Uh, and it just moves it uh, just as normal addition with, uh, with the pointer. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's fill in this table. So uh, someone give me the, the first row here, x bracket 4. Five, five, yeah, we're just getting the thing at, at index 4 in our, in our array. Uh, someone else, what, uh, what are we going to have for x? Yep, that will be a pointer, and what would we put for its value? The A? Yeah, it would be the address of the first, first number in our array. Uh, X plus one? Pointer A plus four. So when we add to a pointer, x is a pointer to an integer. And so we will actually have a plus 4 because it will move one integer. That's what I said, right? Yeah. Oh, I heard a plus 1. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My fault. All right. Address of x index 2. Yes. Yeah. A plus A. And what the what is the type of pointer because of the ampersand? Yeah, so we're getting the integer at index two and then getting the address of that. We know will be A plus A. X bracket five. John. I think technically it would be read as an integer and like the value would be a plus 20 with like that's garbage data, we don't know if it's there. D reference rate. Yeah. yeah, we're just going to get whatever is there in memory as, as an integer. If nothing was assigned, there would be default. Would it be zero or null? So uh, when a when memory is allocated in, in C, we just get the memory with no sort of initialization. So what's there is whatever was last written to that or those bytes of, of memory. So if nothing has been written there since the system booted up, then probably zeros. Otherwise, we have no idea. Uh, which is why it's critical to always initialize variables, fields of structs uh, in, in C because the language is not performing any of this initialization for us. Why is it in? Could it have a star or whatever? So this expression, the compiler will treat as type int because x is a pointer to an int, and we're dereferencing that pointer, and so we interpret whatever is there as an int. But yes, we what is there may have nothing to do with with uh, two's complement integer. Other questions? All right, we'll do these last two. How about star of x plus one? Uh, seven. Mm -hmm. and, and seven. Sorry. Yeah, our star of x plus one is 
same as x bracket. These are literally the same operation, merely different syntax. Whenever we're indexing an array, we are just doing pointer arithmetic and then dereferencing. And when we look at the assembly, that is, there's no difference between these two in terms of the underlying <coughs> construction. And this uh, emphasizes the fact that in almost, not every way, but almost all ways, In C, an array and a pointer are essentially the same thing. We can use, whether if something's declared as a pointer, we can still use this array indexing syntax because all it's doing is pointer is taken and dereferencing. And so uh, there's a few edge cases where things are different, like in the same scope where an array is declared, we can't reassign that variable to something else and we can use size of to get the size of the array. Uh, but as soon as, say, we pass an array to a function, it's indistinguishable from a pointer in every way. All right, how about this, this last one? Yeah, Chris. Uh, is it good style to do pointer arithmetic with the square brackets? If we're not working with an array, but just a generic pointer that's not an array, is that good style? Um, so this does dereference the pointer. Yeah. Um, I guess good style would be use the syntax that is appropriate to the thing you're dealing with. So like if you have a pointer to a single object, you typically like you'd be making assumptions at like what is next to it in memory. If you're using like if you want to dereference a pointer. Uh, Star p is preferred to p bracket zero if it's a pointer or not. Uh, if it's if it is an array, it's like anyone reading your code. They see a variable with brackets, they're going to assume that means that it's an array. And so you wouldn't want it. Yeah, it would not be good style to just use it arbitrarily. <laughs> okay. Other questions. And our last, our last row here, x plus i. Chris? Exactly. We're going to scale our i by the size of what x points to, multiply it by four bytes per minute, add that to the address of, of x. Right, questions about anything in this table before we look at assembly? All right, so how would we actually uh, interact with these arrays in assembly? Let's imagine that we have a function that I'll call get digit, and it specifically takes in a uh, pointer to an integer that we, uh, like documentation says, that z is a zip code, a five-digit uh, code, which we're representing as an array of integers. And then we have uh, a digit that we want out of it as the second argument. And we just return the element of the integer from our array at index uh, digit. And here we can see we're taking in a pointer, we're taking in an address that we're just treating as the start of an array when we're indexing it like an array. And so in assembly, what we would have is 
Uh, we just need to put this thing into our return value. So we're going to want to move L since we're working with integers. And we want the destination to be EAX for our return register. And then that's all we need to do. And we're going to return. And so really we just need the assembly operand to get the element of our array Z at index digit. And by this table, we know pointer arithmetic, we add some number, like we saw x plus 1 dereferenced, same as x bracket. And we know x plus 1 is going to give us our address plus 4. So if we want index 1, we need to add 4 to the address. And we have a memory addressing mode that matches this exactly. We can say, OK, our first argument is the address of the start of the array. That's percent RDI. Our second argument is the index, percent RSI. And the size of the thing in our array, well, those are four bytes each. So we'll multiply four by our index, add that to the address of the start of the array. That gives us the address of a particular element. And then remember parentheses around the number end is saying dereference this point. So then we go to memory at that address, read four bytes with the ADS. And so when I originally talked about this way, this kind of operand in assembly, I call this like register, other register. Um, but they have names, they have other names that kind of nicely map to how they're used here. We refer to a base register, an index register, and then a scale. And the scale can only be 1, 2, 4, or 8. And that's convenient because the size of things that we can have in arrays are either one byte characters, two byte shorts, four byte ints or floats, eight bytes long double or pointers. And that covers everything that we can put in an array. How does it know whether to use one, two, four, or eight? Uh, that's something the compiler, because the compiler is translating the C code into assembly. It knows that this is an array of ints, and therefore the assembly instruction needs to scale by four. What other questions do you have? So, the other critical fact when we are working with arrays is. <coughs> When we pass an array as an argument to a function, we lose all information about the size. Meaning that in this function, were we to try and get the length of our array z, with size of z, which we saw in that zero is how we were getting the size of a particular type that we wanted to mount memory for, this size of z is always going to be 8. The z is a, is a pointer. And so in order to pass an array into a function that needs to know something about the size of the array, even if we use array syntax for the type, we, we can declare a function parameter to be something like this, an array of, of ints. This doesn't mean that any size information gets carried along. This is still just going to be a memory address of the start of the array. And so we 
typically always see the size of the array as an additional argument to our function. So then, inside the function, we need to get the last element. We can do array size minus one. Without size, we would have no idea where the last element is. Kristen? Um, is it like bad if so you always have the first index and the size so hmm. you pass in less? Uh, that, that's an interesting idea. What if we always reserved the element at index zero as the size of the array? Uh, that's certainly something that uh, a convention that a particular function or, or a library could have. Um, and in fact, there are programming languages that do exactly this. Java, for example, you declare an array, it stores the elements in a contiguous chunk of memory just like we've been talking about, but it also stores the length of the array in memory alongside. So it can always check, are you indexing within the bounds of the array? C says, no, if you want to deal with the size, that's up to the programmer how you want to do it. So you could put it as a separate argument or, or part of the array. Um, I, I don't see a particular reason to prefer one over the other performance-wise. Um, having it be part of the array would need to be well documented because that's sort of an unusual thing that's not kind of normal in, in the language, but yeah, that would be one approach. Other questions? All right, how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. So let's do a little bit of practice. So let's just uh, consider a, a loop in C. We have a, a variable i and it applies to zero. We have another variable size. i plus plus. And then inside the loop, we are adding on uh, the, the array element in index i to the variable total. And your task is to uh, fill in the assembly. And I'll give some labels and tell you that there are two lines of assembly that we need under each of these labels to implement a loop like this. And the last thing is that RDI holds R, RSI size, RDX I, RAX total. So Work with your neighbors on turning this uh, C loop into the corresponding six lines of All right. Want to make sure that we uh, get through everything we need to today. So let's, uh, let's talk about how we would fill in our assembly here. So initialization, what variable? Do we need to, it gets initialized as part of these two lines? Um, what if we initialize both um, ISF RIX and RDX because I'm setting my total to zero and I'm also setting my I to zero? Yeah, so uh, th this is not a complete C program, so yes, there would be a total equal zero above uh, this. So uh, we're just doing okay, like these two. Um, I would do Move to parentheses, dollar sign zero, and then parentheses, RDX. No, the um, percentage, <laughs> RDX. 
Yep, we want to initialize i to zero, and then we proceed to to the to the test. Yeah. So if so, this is a long, which is eight bytes. If this was an integer, then all of those things would start with an e rather than a long, right? Okay. Yeah. So we're using the eight byte registers because we're dealing with longs. Um, one uh, one note is that the uh, the compiler will even the compiler might generate move L zero to EDX because that will move zero into the lower four bytes and also write zeros to the upper four bytes. Um, there, there may be some like small compatibility reason why when the compiler can use either a 64-bit or 32-bit instruction, it will choose the 32-bit if they have an equivalent effect. Silas? Can it compare its two uh, longs? Like it, well, on the CMPQ, I'm not comparing compare command. If you do, if you want to compare an int along, what, what does it do? So in a single compare command, it's with us. It, it will have the same size for both operands. So uh, you may have have seen as you've been working on the lab, and it's on the the uh, reference sheet. But you might have move s lq, which says move something that's along to a, move something that's that's a, a long word, four bytes, to a quad or eight bytes, and move s says do sign extension. So whatever the most significant bit is, you copy that out. There's equivalently a move z, which does zero extension for unsigned numbers. But you need one of these instructions to move your four byte thing to an eight byte in order to then be able to compare them as, as eight bytes. So, so, if, so if size and the function above this or whatever was a int, then you'd have to do something at that point. Yes, so uh, if we look at uh, uh, Godbolt, if I change size to an int, we see one of these move with sign extension to make it comparable to i, make them both eight bytes. Um, because if, if size is only four bytes and we read it as an eight byte, kind of all manner of, of mischief can occur. So uh, as this shows, the kind of key new thing here is how we add an element of the array. The assembly on the screen uses different registers than I've set up here. So according to, to these registers, uh, how would we add our kind of current array element to, to total? Sam? Um, or do we or like just read out like a line? Yeah. RDI, comma, RDI, or parentheses, RDI, comma, RDI, is kind of both parentheses, RDI. The array start shifted by i times a to the Yeah, exactly. It, Do we not need the dollar sign for the uh, that's correct. When uh, the when we have a number appearing as one of these scales, or we've also seen that we can have um, some value like integer valued that's some offset that just gets added to the whole the whole thing. We don't need dollar signs in front of those. It's only when we, when we have a number by itself as uh, as an operand like this that we that we need the dollar sign. If we left this dollar sign off, this instruction would say would actually treat zero as a memory address and would try and move the eight bytes at address zero to RDX. So the dollar sign distinguishes that. Um, we also need to add one to RDX, uh, and then the compare and jump, different ways to structure that, which order you do the comparison, and whether you're doing jump greater or, or jump less than or equal to, um, could, could be done in different ways. Louisa? Uh, if this is a children, this is also for Z. So Z is a, an array of ints which are four bytes, oh, right. and we have an array where I said everything is longs over here, so uh, 
Yeah, that's that's where that difference comes from. Other questions? All right, let's talk about structs. So we saw structs in lab zero, just as we needed to use them for linked lists. So now let's talk about how they are functioning in memory. So uh, the syntax, as you may remember, we might have a struct for a song, and it has a car star, a pointer to a character to be the, the string name of the title. Might have an int for the length of the song, and an int for the year released. And if we want to uh, use uh, this, this struct, we could declare a uh, struct itself, which would allocate a, a chunk of memory for these three fields. Uh, we could Also declare a pointer to a struct, which is going to be an eight-byte memory address, uh, and we then might uh, might allocate our uh, uh, space for our struct using malloc, like we saw in lab zero, and uh, as we also saw. My fave. Dot title would be if my fave was the struct itself versus we use this arrow syntax to get the field when my fave, when the variable is a pointer. And this arrow syntax is just short for. dereference the pointer, and then use the dot. So we actually always say dot title, but when we have a pointer, we need to dereference it, and so we have this alternate error syntax that dereferences it, and then extracts the given field. So, like arrays, structs are stored as a contiguous block of memory. So a song struct, how many bytes total would we need to fit all three of these fields? Yeah, we need 16, 8 for the pointer, 4 for each of the int. So size of struct song would give us 16 bytes it would take to restore this. So the other thing that the system needs to know is where in these 16 bytes do these different parts of the struct live. So we can think about the offset inside the struct that our title zero bytes into the struct, it's at the start. And the fields will be stored in the order you declare them in the struct. Title will be at zero, length at eight, year 12. And this is like, how many bytes into our 16 byte chunk would we find a particular field? Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Eric, 
does 16 mean under the stress law? So this is we need 16 bytes total to store a single one of these song structs. Why not 12? So this int here starts at byte 12, but it, it takes forward on that. John? So since, like, since we know like, what's at each offset, are there like situations where people use like array overflow or like variable overflow to interact with other like that struct values? Like, is, that, is that a thing that is, is used positively or is overflow just kind of consistently more of a problem in the future? 100% uh, terrible bug. Uh, that does not mean that no one ever uses it. Uh, that means it's often relied upon in undocumented ways. So, uh, but yeah, don't do that. It, 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 uh, incredible recipe for unfixable books. Um, all right, so any other questions on the struct stuff so far? Okay, so let's talk about how this works in assembly. So uh, let's say I'm going to define another struct here. Call it rec, short for record. It's going to have an array of four ints, call it A. A long, I'll call I. and a pointer to another uh, struct of the same type. And if I say declare a variable r that's a type of the struct, then we can say in memory we're going to have r is um, I guess address of R is going to be the start of our, of our struct here. A will be the first 16 bytes, our array of four ints. Then 16 in, we have I. And then 24 in, we have our next pointer and the whole thing is, is 32 bytes. And so if we were to look at code for this struct, if we want a function get i, takes in a pointer to one of these structures and just returns r long i out of that struct. The compiler is going to know that in every one of these structs, i starts 16 bytes in from the start of our struct. It's just always where we can find this field because it'll always appear second because we follow this order. And so, we see that RDI, our first argument to this function, will be the, the start of R here. And so we just want to add 16, do that offset into the struct to get this address, and then dereference that and move those eight bytes to our return value. And so the compiler, because it has our C code, it knows what these offsets are, and so those offsets just get put in directly uh, to the assembly, to where where it retrieves these specific fields. We can look at another example. If we want to get the address of i, that is we want to uh, uh, retrieve i and then return the address of where it is, 
Exact same assembly code, except we use LEA to just add 16 to our pointer rather than add 16 and then dereference it and go get the value of i. That's it. Um, so then if you have a pointer, a car pointer to a string, do you have a dot in the text? Would it be referenced twice um, to get a string, or would it just give you a pointer in the text? Like if we have car star s and you're saying s dot. Um, no, no, like in the size of the structure, mm. you do a ref dot s. Uh, that would give you the, the pointer, it would give you the address. Uh -huh. So you, you could do like star of r dot s, and that would give you the first character that, that it's pointing to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions? All right, if we look at address of next, that just like before, we want to uh, get the address of this next pointer, which is going to be a pointer to a pointer, which is why, which is where these two two asterisks come from, because our, our next is a pointer type, and if we want the address of next, that's a pointer to this pointer. Uh, but just like before, we just add the offset to the address of the start of our struct. That gives us the address uh, of, of our, our pointer there, and the compiler is just figuring out that, okay, I have 16 bytes worth of A and 8 worth of I for a total of 24 uh, to retrieve the, the next field. And if we wanted to get a specific integer out of our array A here, we get in a pointer to the struct and we are given an index. Well, we know that the address of the start of the struct happens to also be the address of the start of our array. So that will just be a move with a base and index register for the start of the struct and our index moved, in our, moved into our return value. Questions on any of these examples? Okay. So the final thing is an idea of what's called data alignment, which is that Hardware prefers what are called aligned addresses, which for x86 that we want the address of a particular quantity in memory, like the, the literal number that is the address to be a multiple of the size of that element. And this is because our, our hardware is designed to read and write chunks of memory in uh, uh, specific sizes. So that writing one, two, four, or eight bytes, or reading one, two, four, or eight bytes in uh, one of these aligned chunks is going to be more efficient than if we have our, say, our eight bytes of our long split across two different of these eight byte chunks. Because what the hardware will probably have to do is read the first eight, eight, eight bytes, get the few of those bytes that correspond to our quantity, read the next eight bytes, get those other bytes, stick them together. It can do it, but when we have these uh, data stored at these aligned addresses, 
it's going to reduce the amount of work that the system has to do to read and write memory. So the consequence of this for structs is that within a struct, it will put each field at an offset into the struct that makes it so that, that, it's at, that it obeys this alignment property. So uh, for example, If we had our struct foo, and it has a character C and an int I, in memory, we have one byte of C, but if we put the int I right after that, it won't be alarmed, because it will be one byte off from being in a multiple of four. And so the system will add three bytes of internal fragmentation, just unused garbage space into our struct. So our struct will be 8 bytes in total size rather than the 5 bytes it takes to store this because it will align this int to be at a, a multiple form. If you're declaring like multiple characters, like let's say you're declaring four characters and then the int, would it line up or would that be uh, internal fragmentation would be fine? So it lays out the fields in the order you declare it. Yeah. So in fact, if we switched these two, we get four bytes of it, one byte of character. Although, as we don't have time to talk about now, we also want the total size of the struct to obey uh, alignment. And so we have external fragmentation in addition to, to internal. Yeah, Eric. I think we're going to if you had a second card would it start at the fourth byte or would it start at the second byte? Yeah, if we added a car C2, we'd get C2 right after C and still need two, two bytes of pass. So if I wanted to be evil, I'd alternate all my cars and ints to cause as much fragmentation as possible. Yes, I, I believe you could design an extremely inefficient struct armed with the, the knowledge from today's class. Okay, we'll talk, we'll finish up with fragmentation next time. We're almost back on schedule. Uh, keep working on, on the lab. Uh, office hours tomorrow night in, in uh, Olin 310. And I'll see you Wednesday. Thank you. I don't really thought about what I like to first.